Okay, Jeremiah chapter 48. 48. Have you ever felt like life has not given you a fair chance? I think we've all been there, right? Where, where we have struggled through some situation, some relationship, some financial difficulty. And it's so stressful that we just kind of shout out or in our mind just say, life just isn't fair, is it? I used to have a neighbor that would quite often come to me and, and ask me as he sees me over the fence. And he says, so how's life treating you? you know, and, and at first I, I didn't know how to answer it. I would always say, pretty good. Everything's going all right. And after a while, you know, the guy's asking me almost every time he sees me. I finally said, life is treating me bad, but Jesus treats me good. And so that was my answer from that point on. Well, life is bad, and it is difficult. We go through struggles and problems. You just read the Bible, and you can see from the Old Testament all the way to Revelation that there are uh, tribulations and trials and troubles that are around the corner for all of us. But, but we may have those things, but we don't have to dwell in them. We can dwell in Jesus Christ and we can find a way out and find the peace and the rest that comes with knowing our Savior, Jesus Christ. That he is our deliverer, that he is our strength, and he is our power. And that this world is temporal compared to the eternity that awaits for us. And that is our hope. That is our hope that one day we will leave this place and we will ascend into heaven and be with our Lord. It's just a temporary place. Uh, like the grass grows and withers away and it's gone tomorrow. So our lives are that way from time to time. I was just talking to my mom and asking her how she was doing. And uh, I asked her how my sister was because she visited from Texas. And she says, well, she's already back in Texas. I'm like, what? How long was she down here? Two weeks? I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't I just pick you up from Victorville and bring you down? Yeah, two weeks ago. Really? It just seemed like yesterday I did that. I mean, just time just goes so fast. And believe me, for those of you who are younger, when you get older, it's going to go faster. It really does get faster. You're just like, where is it going? And so it's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And so we need to be focused on the eternal. Now, as we continue on in Jeremiah, apart from the writings against Babylon, this writing of judgment on Moab is the longest of Jeremiah's writings against the nation. And so we have chapter 48, something like 40, 47 verses that we'll be speaking towards Jeremiah. Uh, many of them will be repetitive, so we'll go through it rather quickly. But I want to talk a little bit about Moab. Now we find the first mention of Moab in Genesis. I don't know if you're familiar with Genesis, if you read Genesis at all. If you are, then you'll be familiar with this verse. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 36, it talks about Moab and where Moab came from. And, and literally, <clears throat> it was after um, God had went to Lot, I mean to Abraham, and said, I'm going down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And through prayer and pleading, the angel spared Lot and his family. Of course, his wife turned back and she became a pillar of salt. And so a lot there is in the mountains and he literally is thinking that the world has been destroyed. And so he has a relationship with, with one of his uh, daughters. And it says in Genesis 19.36, Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Now, you think, wait a minute. <laughs> Why would God approve of that? Why would God allow that? You have to understand the Old Testament. I, I constantly hear this from the atheists and the critics of the Bible. You believe in a God that, that, that believes in polygamy, more wives. No, I don't. And God isn't one that believes in that. You're mistaken. You believe in a God that, that stones children. I go, no, I don't, because that's not God. You believe in a God that uh, is okay with incest. No, I don't believe that, and neither does God. See, the Old Testament is a book of history. It really is, and it's just telling us the history of the people of God. And the people of God are wretched. They're sinners, and they are recording exactly what was taking place. And so this is a recording. It's not God's approval. It's not God's stamp of seal. God is disgusted in it completely. When he created, as Genesis says, he created a man and a woman, and that was his intention. Now go out and prosper. 
Multiply and fill the earth. That was his true intention. Not to have essential relationships whatsoever. A father with daughters. That's not his heart. And so it's just revealing to us the humanity in history and that it is, it is truly a, a wretched humanity. Now, for me, I think that's evidence that the Bible is the word of God because it's not hiding anything. If you were trying to convince somebody that you were God, you would probably make yourself look really good. You would probably maybe uh, clean up all the stories you know, and so hopefully no one has a negative idea, no one has a negative thought, and they think, wow, this guy's really great. But the Bible doesn't do that. It just reveals history to us as it went. And so how God intervened in this, these situations. Now, because of this sin, and it is sin, God's going to judge them because of it. And so his daughter has the firstborn uh, a son called Moab, verse 37 says. This is where Moab came from. Moab was the son of Lot by incestuous relationships with his eldest daughter. Both the descendants and the land were known as Moab. So Moab was the son of Lot, but also became the ruler of that land in that area, which then became uh, the land of Moab or the people of the Moabites. You may have heard that name before, the Moabites. So the land of Moab was just east of the Dead Sea. So if you look at Israel and you're looking straight at it going up north and you see the Mediterranean Sea there and you see Israel coming down here, the Dead Sea's here and this is where Moab dwelt, the descendants of Lot. The Bible has preserved the name of, the, of, of many of the Moabite towns and we find that throughout scriptures from Numbers all the way to Jeremiah 48. Uh, Moab, like others, was a highly organized kingdom with good agricultural, pastoral pursuits, uh, splendid buildings, distinctive pottery, strong fortifications uh, in the shape of small fortresses strategically placed around their borders to protect them. If you remember when the children of Israel were uh, crossing into the land of Canaan, they, they came to what they call the King's Highway, which crossed a plateau, and it was in the area of Moab. And they asked Moab, could we cross over? And Moab says, no. They refused Israel to cross over. And so they became enemies to a certain degree. <clears throat> Moses was forbidden to attack Moab despite uh, their unfriendliness. And although the Moabites were henceforth to be excluded from Israel, and we find that in Deuteronomy and Numbers 31, that God was ultimately going to deal with them. We have some that you may uh, know and are familiar with stories that are Moabites that are part of Lot's ancestry like Balak. You remember Balak and Balaam? He was the king that asked for Balaam to come and prophesy over Israel as Israel was camped down by uh, the valley there and um, Balak was very scared of them and so he wanted Balaam to come and prophesy against them so that they would be destroyed. I don't know if you remember that story. And so Balaam in the donkey story, you know, and so he comes to uh, uh, the king and he basically says, I can't, I can't prophesy against them. I can only tell you what God will tell me. And so God basically reinforced his covenant with Israel and said, you're not going to touch them. They're my people. He will not destroy them. And over and over several times until Balak finally said, look, Balaam, I will give you half of my kingdom. In a I will give you whatever you want. Just tell me what to do. And so Balak, uh, Balaam, knowing Israel and knowing the God of Israel, which is very interesting, knowing the God of Israel, the God of Israel is holy. He's holy and he's pure. And the Bible says that how can uh, darkness have anything to do with light? You know, Paul talks about being unevenly yoked together with a, a person. If you have a believer with an unbeliever, how can that be? If you have dark with lightness, how can that be? How do they commingle? How can a, an idol like Balaam commingle with God Jehovah? It doesn't. And so how can light dwell with darkness? It doesn't. How can goodness and, and purity and holiness dwell with darkness? It doesn't. And that's why God is constantly trying to work through us to give up those things that are darkness, that are evil, that are not pure. Uh, he works in our lives because these are things that, that, that he can't have fellowship with. 
and it limits uh, his resources to us. It limits our relationship, and he just wants to pour so much into us if we're so if we are just willing enough to let darkness go. But if we embrace darkness, then he's limit limited in, in pouring into us. Jude says, "Stand under the love of God." You know, stand under it. Let it just pour on you. And it's a constant pouring, but if you remove yourselves from the love of God, then God isn't pouring on you. And because he's a holy God, and Balaam knew this, he knew this, and so he instructed them, this is what you do. You, you, you take the most beautiful virgins in your land and you send them down there. And as they go down there and they begin to have relationships with the Israelites, God can't dwell with them. In fact, he will judge them. And that's exactly what happened. He knew their God. Those were the Moabites, very cunning people. In the days of Judges, Eglon, king of Moab, invaded Israel's land as far as Jericho and oppressed Israel, oppressed Israel for 18 years. And so there's many stories. Saul warred against with the um, Moabites. David lodged uh, his parents. You remember when David was running from Saul for a while? He actually lodged his parents uh, with the Moabites as fugitives, but then later on subdued the Moabites uh, as he became king again. And so we hear all of these wonderful stories about the Moabites and and who they were. And, And as we read about them, we say, wow, these were wretched people. These people were sinners. Yes, they were. And God loved them and God gave them the opportunity to repent and they would not. And we're going to see in this chapter and many other verses that we won't see tonight, but you will find that God will ultimately judge Moab. And do you know of any Moabite tonight? Anybody know of a Moabite? God was true to his word. They no longer exist. But we all know Israelites, don't we? They're still around because they're God's chosen people. So let's look at the judgment. First one, against Moab. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Woe to Nebo, for it is plunder. kajerth is shamed and taken. The high stronghold is shamed and dismayed. No more praise of Moab. In Hishbon, they have devised evil against her. Come and let us cut her off as a nation. You also shall be cut down, O madman. The sword shall pursue you. Uh, Hishbam was a city in the northern part of Moab there, uh, an area sometimes uh, uh, Israel had uh, control of. Uh, Hishbam was also located along that king's highway that we spoke about what Israel tried to cross over there. Uh, the madman name there may have been used as a wordplay uh, for uh, reason with the, the word, verb of, of being silent. In other words, I will silence you as a madman. You will no longer be effective. A voice of crying shall be uh, from Horem, plundering and great destruction. Moab is destroyed. Her little ones uh, have cursed or have caused a cry to be heard. For in the ascents of Luthith, they ascend with continual weeping. For in the descent of Horem, the enemies have heard a cry of destruction. Flee, save your lives, and be like the juniper in the wilderness. For because you have trusted in your works and your treasures, you also shall be taken. Now, highlight that. And, and remember, the Bible teaches Again, from Genesis to Revelation, that we are not to trust in our own works. We're not to trust in in our goodness. I mean, in the very beginning, did not God, did not God reject Cain's offering? Because it was a work of his hands. But he accepted Abel's, which was a lamb. So in the very beginning, God rejects the works of our hands. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor, then why do we work? Why do we do anything? Why do we serve? We serve and we work because it's out of adoration and love for the Lord. No other reason. Uh, We can't work to gain any love from God or anything from God. God is gracious and he will give us what we need. And he'll even go beyond that. No, we work because we love him. And we love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. So our works... The works of our hands, our treasures, and what we give is nothing compared to his work. 
the Bible says that our works are are like <clears throat> filthy rags in another sense because our hearts are are corrupt and evil. When we think that we can somehow appease God or, or, or please him with our works or, or, or gain something from him, it, it, it's nothing compared to him. And so what do we need? Abraham, Roman, Roman says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Not his works. But yet James says, but it was his works, his works of faith that God counted to righteousness. How, how, now, how do you qualify that? Well, because our works of faith is done because we have faith. If you have faith, Paul says, then you will have works. But not works that gain, not works that we can receive salvation through, but works that are just the natural pouring of love to God. And so be careful that you don't misunderstand what your works are. They, they are not works that we can trust will gain any anything from the Lord whether it's salvation or any special favors no no God is gracious and when we come to him uh, I'll encourage you to do this when you come to him uh, don't 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 ever say Lord look what I just did for you could you uh-uh, don't do that just say Lord because you're gracious could you yeah the God says yeah you know I'm gracious I will See, that's the proper way of approaching him, not, not our works, not our works. Lord, could you just bless me? I used, I used to love hearing Chuck say this. He goes, every morning I get up and I just say, Lord, I pray your grace just flows on me today. And he'd do that every day. And it had nothing to do with his works. Just, Lord, because you are gracious, just let your grace and your blessings just flow on us today. That's how we approach him, because you are a loving God and a caring. You also shall be taken, and Shemosh shall go forth into captivity, his priests and his princess together. Now, who is Shemosh? We find a, a reference to uh, this word here in Numbers chapter 21, 29, where it says, Woe to you, Moab, have you perished, O people of Shemosh? He has given his sons as fugitives, fugitives and his daughters into captivity. Um, Shemash meaning subdue. Shemash was the national god of Moab. This was an idol, also an idol of the Moabites, a Canaanite deity that they had worshipped. Some suggest that they would actually have uh, baby offerings to Shemash. Now, abortion is not new. <laughs> it didn't start with Roe versus Wade. You know, uh, it didn't start with us. It started back in the Old Testament. Uh, back when they used to take babies and they would literally offer them at best sacrifices unto an idol so that they could get something in in return. He was also known as a destroyer, a subduer. Um, you may have even seen pictures of him as a, a fish god, a fish god. He was Shemash. It says in verse 8, And the plunder shall come against every city. No one shall escape. The valley also shall perish, and the plain shall be destroyed, as the Lord has spoken. Now we know that Solomon ended up erecting a high place, an altar to Shemus, later on in his life. Uh, You know Solomon started off good, but he ended up worshiping idols because of his uh, lust for, for women and having many concubines. And he offered up a, a, a sacrifice to Shemas, I'm sure, there on the mountain. Now that tells us, that tells us that today there are many people who are offering up sacrifices to abortion, plant parenthood. I, I love what one guy said statistically. You know, they always use the, the uh, fact that uh, plant parenthood is there because of those that are raped uh, those that are having babies from those rapes or those that were having incest, you know, and got pregnant and so forth and that we can't take that away. The percentage is so minute, it's ridiculous compared to how many, how many are doing it just out of convenience and don't want to be bothered with a human being in their life. And so they're still offering up sacrifices on the mountain to Shemas to this day. We need to really get involved with with that. I think if there's anything that we could ever get involved in, that would be the thing to get involved in. Because uh, murder and the blood of these innocent babies by the millions, over 50 million babies, more than all the world's world wars that have been fought, 
have died innocently at the hands of, of people who, who um, profess that this is my body and I have a right to it. Well, it's not your body and you don't have a right to it. Believe me, go out there and try to prostitute yourself. You'll be arrested. Well, wait a minute, it's my body. I can prostitute. No, you can't. It's illegal. So it's not your body. Even the government tells you what you have to do with your body. Try driving around naked. See what happens if you drive around naked. But it's my body. I can drive around naked. Yeah, watch and see what happens. They'll arrest you if you drive around naked in public. Now, we're getting to the point where that's not happening, happening as much. People are literally doing that. It's amazing. But it just shows you how corrupt we're getting. No, you look, you look at the anatomy of a woman and a baby. There's only one little cord that attaches them together. It's a totally different body. And that baby has rights. And you know that. I'm preaching to the choir here. So we need to pray and we need to really sign petitions and, and Naomi's gonna gonna try to get us some links and stuff where we can all, you know, at least let someone know that we're we're not for this. We need to stop this. Uh, there's adoption. There are plenty of people out there that would love to have a little baby in their home that can't have babies, uh, not just here but all over the world. <sighs> Good thing to get involved. Give wings to Moab, verse 9, that she may flee and get away, for her cities shall be desolate without any to dwell in them. Remember, this is judgment. Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. And cursed is he who keeps back his sword from blood. Highlight that in verse 10. Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. Can you do the work of the Lord deceitfully? I thought when you're doing the work of the Lord, that's a good thing and, and it's an honest thing and, and you should be doing it. And there's many who do it deceitfully. How about the guy that just recently said, I need $65 million so I can get a jet. I need a jet. And he threw the plea out there. And he threw it out there he, to the church and to the faith and the wealth people and he got $70 million. $70 million. I'd like to have just 500000 of that. That's nothing. But yeah, there are people doing the work of the Lord deceitfully for their own gain. How about Joel Osteen, who has a nice little mansion, little summer house, a little jet, and all of that. Deceitfully, not even sharing the truth of the gospel. Deceitfully. Cursed, the Bible says, is that man. That's a scary thing for me it is, to stand behind this pulpit and to be deceitful in the teaching of the word of God. It is. You're going to stand before God. And if you believe in the word, and I don't think they really believe in the word. They just think it's probably written by man, but they're taking advantage of the fact that they can use it to manipulate man and take old ladies' pensions from them. But boy, wait till they stand before God on judgment day. And they will be cast into outer darkness. That scares me. I don't want to be deceitful with God's word. I want to be honest. Somebody asked me a question the other day about a scripture and so we were looking at it, and I'm like, wow, I really don't know. From what it sounds like, it sounds like that that group of people really didn't know the Lord, but it looked like they saw what the Lord was doing in their lives, and so they acknowledged that their God was pretty powerful. I think that's what it's saying, but I don't know, I can't say. And so then we started looking up some commentaries, and another commentary said the same thing. I said, maybe that's what it is, but to tell you the truth, it doesn't say. And so we can't really say. Let's just take it for what, it, what it's saying, that these people acknowledge that God. Whether they believed in that God or whether they didn't, I don't know. We'll leave that up to the Lord. Yeah. And so we need to be very honest with the Word of God and very clear with the Word of God. The Word of God can be tricky, can't it? Because at one point you're, you're, you're saying, okay, serve the Lord, but don't serve the Lord with a wrong heart. <laughs> and so you're going, oh, so what do I do? How do I figure that out? And so you have to read your word and you see the people that have served with the right heart and you see the people that didn't serve with the right heart. You look at Judas Iscariot and you say, okay, those are the things I want to stay away from. But you see Peter who struggled, put his foot in his mouth many times, made mistakes, but you know he continued to just seek the Lord and the Lord sought him. So you try to find the balance of it. I really believe that there's balance. With all these doctrines that are out there, like the, we keep focusing on the, uh, the wealth and health doctrine, I don't know why, 
But that doctrine that says God wants you healthy and he wants you wealthy. God, God doesn't want you sick. And if you're sick, it's because you don't have any faith or you're not giving enough. So if you gave enough, you had enough faith, you'd never be sick. Now, I remember the, one of the guys that had preached that message. And then all of a sudden, one day, I saw him wearing glasses. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. If he had enough faith, he shouldn't be wearing glasses. But he had to wear glasses. And he started dyeing his hair. Wait a minute. If he had enough faith, his hair would be black. You know, and so you, you just can't beat the truth. You just can't. But you lie your way through to people that are gullible and they just believe you because they, they, they just, they want hope so badly. And these people know that. They know that. But I believe that God does want us wealthy. But not to that extreme. We have to find the balance. And if you're wealthy, he wants, to use, he wants you to use that for his glory. He's very clear in the epistles that those that are wealthy should use it for the glory of God and to help the needs of others. And so, so the balance. Calvinism, Arminianism, once saved, always saved. You lose your salvation. I think there's a balance. Yeah, you could lose your salvation. Yeah, God will keep you until the very end. Okay, so which one is it? It's both. So abide in Christ and you're fine. You don't have to worry about losing it or, you know, and so forth. Just stay on course. Stay with the Lord. So God doesn't choose us from the very founding? Yes, he does. But we have free choice? Yeah, we do. How does that work? I have no idea. But you chose, he knew, he called before the foundations of the world. That's as much as I know. And I'm not a theologian. <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's a balance of it. And Chuck used to always say there's a pendulum. And that pendulum is going back and forth. Don't let the pendulum swing way over there or way over there. Let it swing in the middle. Find the balance of the word of God. Don't try to be deceitful with it. Moab, verse 11, has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs. And has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained in him, and his scent has not changed. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I shall send him wine workers who will tip him over and empty his vessels and break the bottle. So that's basically talking about the judgment that was coming upon him. Moab shall be ashamed of Shishmas, as the house of Israel was ashamed of Bethel, uh, their confidence. So he's comparing their idolatry, right? And so just as they worshiped that idol and Israel worshiped the idol and was judged, they will be judged. How can you say we are mighty and strong men for the war? Moab is plundered and gone up from their cities. Her chosen young men have gone down to the slaughter, said the king whose name is the Lord of hosts. Uh, the calamity of Moab is near at, near at hand and his affliction comes quickly. Be, be mourn him, all you who are around him and all you who know his name. Saith how the strong stiff, or stiff is broken, staff is broken and beautiful rod. <clears throat> o daughters inhabiting Dibon, come down from your glory and sit in, in thirst for the plunder of Moab has come against you. He has destroyed your strongholds. O inhabitant of error, stand by the way and watch. Ask him who flees and her who escapes. Say, what has happened? <clears throat> Moab is shamed, for he is broken down. Wail and cry. Tell it to Aaron that Moab is plundered. <clears throat> At this point here, God has been judging all of their territory. So all the land that they have owned has been totally plundered and been taken away. And judgment has come on the plain country, on the Holon and the Jaza and the Misfith, on Debon and Nebo and Bethlehem. And then he goes on and names all these other ones. Verse 25. The horn of Moab is cut off. A horn was a symbol of strength. And so his strength, his power, his ability to war has, has just been, been drained completely. He has no power. His arm is broken, saith the Lord. Make him drunk because he exalts himself against the Lord. Moab shall wallow in his vomit and he shall also be in 
derision. That's <clears throat> interesting there because you almost think that Peter may have thought about that when he talked about a dog returning to its own vomit, uh, about a person who was in the world and comes out of the world and has this relationship with God and is changing and growing, but all of a sudden decides that he'd go back to the world. And Peter says that's like a dog returning to its own vomit and licking up his vomit. And that's what Jeremiah is saying about Moab here, that make him drunk because he exalts himself against the Lord. And Moab shall wallow in his vomit because of his pride against God. For was not Israel a derision to you? Was he found among thieves? For whoever you speak of him, you shake your head in scorn. You who dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rock. And be like the dove which makes her nest in the sides of the cave's mouth. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceedingly proud of his loftiness his, and arrogance and pride and of the haughtiness of his heart. Again, he's lifted it up against the Lord. Uh, I have my works. I have my own strength. I don't need you, God. I can do my own thing. I can do it without you. That's all pride and haughtiness. And the Lord uh, doesn't like that. I think was it Proverbs chapter 1 says the beginning of wisdom you know, is, is what? The beginning of wisdom is what? Huh? To fear the Lord. <clears throat> and so not the pride, but the fear of the Lord, reverence and love of the Lord. I know his wrath, says the Lord, but it is not right. He lies. His lies have made nothing right. Therefore, I will wail for Moab and I will cry out for all Moab. I will mourn for the men of Ker Hiram. O vine of Shemath, I will weep for you with the weeping of Jazer. Your plants have gone over the sea. They reach to the sea of Jazer. The plunder has fallen on your summer fruit and your vintage. Joy and gladness are taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab. I have caused wine to fail from the winepress. No one will tread with joyous shouting, not joyous shouting. From the cry of Hishbon to Elia and to Jahaz, they have uttered their voice. From Zor to Harim, like a three-year-old heifer, for the waters of Nimrim also shall be desolate. Moreover, says the Lord, I will cause to cease in Moab the one who offers sacrifice in the high places and burnt incense to their God or to his God. Therefore, my heart shall wail like flutes for Moab. And like flutes, my heart shall wail for the men of Kershirim. Therefore, the riches they have acquired have perished. For every head shall be bald, and every beard clipped. On all the hands shall be cuts, and on the loins sackcloth. A general lamentation on all the housetops of Moab and in its streets. For I have broken Moab like a vessel in which is no pleasure, saith the Lord. They shall wail how she is broken down, how Moab has turned her back with shame. So Moab shall be a derision and a dismay and all those about her. For thus says the Lord, behold, one shall fly like an eagle and spread his wings over Moab. Kareth is taken and the strongholds are, are surprised. The mighty men's hearts in Moab on that day shall be like the hearts of a woman in birth pain. And Moab shall be destroyed as a people. And, and so there's the promise of Moab being totally destroyed there as a people itself. And so they no longer exist today because of their idolatry. Because he exalts himself against the Lord. Fear the pit and the snare shall be upon you. O inhabitants of Moab, saith the Lord... He who flees from the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who gets out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For upon Moab, upon it, I will bring the year of their punishment, saith the Lord. Those who fled stood under the shadow of Hishbon because of exhaustion. But a fire shall come out of Hishbon, a flame from the midst of Sihon, and shall devour the brow of Moab, the crown of the head of the sons of Tumut. 
Woe to you, O Moab, the people of Shishmas perish, for your sons have been taken captive and your daughters captive. Yet I will bring back the captives of Moab in the latter days, saith the Lord. Thus far is the judgment of Moab. Now, they're not done yet, and history shows they all they go all the way up until Alexander, and then all of a sudden they they seem to, to disappear. And so we have the the judgment of Moab here as the first nation that Jeremiah uh, shares with us. It's a type of judgment in the Old Testament is a type of the judgment that will come in the end. And it is a judgment that God will bring about all men. There are two types of judgment. There is the judgment, the Bema Seat of Christ, and then there is the great wine, white throne judgment of God. The great white throat judgment of God, throne of God, is the judgment of all those who do not believe. They will all stand before God and God will cast them into outer darkness. He will hold them accountable for all of their sins and they will be remembered, every one of the, their actions against God and then he will cast them out and they will know, they will know that that judgment is fair and just when they are judged. The the Bema seat of Christ is the judgment of believers. We will not be judged uh, in condemnation, but we will be judged on our works. Our works will be tested whether they are true and whether they were pure and done with the right motives. And those works that, that go through the fire, that are not hay, wood, and stubble, and that are gold and pure, then God will reward us accordingly to what we have done. And so it's important that we serve the Lord now while we're here on earth so that when we do get to heaven and we stand before Christ there is a reward that comes to us and it's important that we serve the Lord with the right heart now the great white throne judgment of God as he cast him into the outer pit we know that that pit was prepared for Satan and a third of the angels that rebelled in heaven that was the reason for the creating of that pit not for humanity God never intended to judge man. In fact, God is very sorrowful that he would have to have anyone perish into everlasting life. Peter's clear. He says the Lord would rather that none would perish. And so God literally is not sending many to hell or separation. It is many who are choosing to be separated from God because they will not acknowledge him, they will not accept him, nor will they surrender their lives to him. And so when they stand before him, he's basically going to kind of open the door and say, why should I let you into my kingdom? And you'll stand there and go, I don't know why. Uh, my good works, I gave, I tried to be a good person, uh, I did the best that I could, I tried to be fair in life, and he's like, nah, -uh. that won't get you in, I'm sorry. I sent my son for a reason. My son was sent there. He even prayed, if this cup could be removed from me, take it, Lord. And I says, no, you have to die on the cross. You have to pay for the sins of the world. It's the only way that mankind can enter into heaven is by believing and trusting and surrendering to Jesus Christ. And so when you stand before Christ as a Christian and he opens that door and says, why should I let you in? You say, because your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross in my place. And so I would like to come in by your grace and by my faith in him alone. That's it. I have nothing to offer you. And God opens that door and says, come in, come in. See, it's not our works. It's his work completely. But we have to surrender our lives to him. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, today's the day. You need to surrender your life to him and let him have a hold of your life. He has a purpose for your life. There's a reason for you being born. Before the foundations of the world, he created you with that purpose. But you're not fulfilling that purpose by living separate from him. He has a beautiful plan for your life if you will surrender to him. And if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, and there is no God. What have you lost? You haven't lost anything. I mean, I think we're all pretty good, decent people here. 
You know, I know a lot of you have eaten food with you and had some good times, served together here in fellowship, and you definitely put up with me listening to me every Sunday and Wednesday, and you know, I haven't lost much. But if you're wrong, if you're wrong, and you gambled, saying, no, I'm not going to surrender my life, then you've lost eternal salvation. You know how long eternity is? I've been around for 54 years, and I think that's long. <laughs> I'm ready to go home. My mom's been around for, for 76 years or so, and she thinks that's long. I know this guy that's been around for 86 years, and he's like, I don't know why God still has me here. <laughs> you know, I don't know why I sit here in this chair and do nothing all day long. Why does he have me here? To talk to someone like me, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but eternity, uh, add a thousand years to that. You know, just think about a thousand years or, or let's say 10 of your lifetimes. That's not even beginning eternity. Well, let, let, let's, let's go a million years and think how long that is and then get to that signpost that says a million years. Like, well, you just begun. You just begun. So another quadrillion years to go. Eternity is eternity. Now, think of separation from God. And you are conscious. You're aware and you will be there for eternity. Believe me. It's what the Bible says and I believe it. I don't know how you will survive. But the Bible says that it's like the, the worm that's in the fire. And it's just curling up and dying. But it doesn't burn. And it doesn't die. And you will be fully aware that you're there justly before God. Don't let that happen. When I really focus on that, <clears throat> I always think of my dad. Because my dad did not receive Jesus Christ. My dad died alone <clears throat> on his way to the hospital. He was having a heart attack. <clears throat> and he drove up to White Memorial Hospital in L.A., parked his car, and he died right there. And he died without Christ. And if the Bible's true and he died without Christ, at this moment, he's there with Lazarus, separated by that big gulf, waiting to be judged at the great white throne judgment of God. And when I think about that, it just hurts so much that I have to stop thinking about it. I just have to put it out of my mind because I can't dwell on that. But I know my God is a fair God. I know he's a just God, and I know he gave him every opportunity. But please... You still have an opportunity here to be saved. You still have a choice. You, there's still a chance for you. Don't let it slide. Don't give it up. <clears throat> Stick with Jesus. It's not worth it. It is not worth it. I encourage you to read your Bible, to study it, to see if these things are true. Please don't believe me and don't believe your friends who are telling you, oh, the book's filled with a bunch of lies, a bunch of misquotes, stuff that doesn't, you know what? Show me. Show it to me because you're talking about my eternal state here. And if you want me to believe you and risk my eternal state, I better know for sure that what you're telling me is the truth before I just give in to you. Don't do that. Search it for yourself and find that these things are true. I've read the Bible back from Genesis to Revelation you know, a lot of times, a lot of times. I have found some errors, very, very few, where you go, especially in the Kings and Chronicles, because they're telling the same stories, and the writer says, 10,000 and then all of a sudden another writer says like 100,000 and you go oh wow that's an error can't believe it no it it's numbers it has nothing with the story it's a number it's a number and the writer just got that wrong who translated it <clears throat> there are no errors in there I've read it over and over again but again don't believe me read it for yourself <clears throat> because you're Life is depending upon your decision. And I hope you'd make that decision to give your life to Jesus. In fact, I encourage you, 
it wouldn't hurt to just say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my God right now, and you show me. I want you to show me that you're my God. I want you to show me that you're real. I want you to be real in my life. And if you're sincere, I guarantee you, he will be real in your life. Give him that opportunity to be real in your life. <clears throat> I could tell you so many stories. I just know that God's real. He, he has just spoken so clearly to me many, many, many times. And I think the greatest uh, evidence for us is our own relationship with Jesus and how he's ministered to us. I mean, you just can't beat that, right? I mean, it, it's not the historical, the textual criticism, the archaeology, the prophecies. It was all great, and it, and it really builds upon it. But to have a personal relationship with God and he ministered to you, I mean, it just, it's like, wow, I just know he's real. I remember my wife and I were dealing with a situation. We were praying and trying to make a good decision, godly decision. <clears throat> and so we were praying, and we, we're very spiritual so we really feel the lord and she has a gift of prophecy uh and, and various other gifts we both have the gift of tongues uh, corinthians uh, 12 13 and 14 if you want to read about it and we were praying and the lord gave her a message and so she she prophesied and um i thought okay all right that's that's good let's let's continue to pray about it and so i actually went to someone else in the church at the time that also i knew had the gift of prophecy too and the spiritual gifts and so i didn't tell them anything about what virginia said and then so i said could you just pray for us you know she's not here right now but could you pray for us that god would just give us wisdom and so she started praying for us and then while she was praying all of a sudden she said exactly the same thing virginia said per, per word and i was just like well, I, I had my eyes open while she's praying i'm like how did she know <laughs> How did she know? You know, and I asked her after, Hi, did you talk to Virginia? No. I didn't even know you were going to come up and ask me for prayer. And those are the things that, that, that has happened in our lives over and over and over again that we know God is real. You know? and, and so when someone comes up to me and after a message, and it's been happening like all this last couple of weeks where people are like, wow. And I had a man visit us uh, Wednesday, uh, Sunday and he was just weeping. He's like, wow, you just like ministered to God. How did you know? Like, I don't know anything. It's the first time I've seen you here. You know, and, and God, through the Holy Spirit, ministered to you. And that's when you know, wow, God is real. He really is real. And, and then when you start seeing that and approaching him, then all of a sudden he starts working in your life. And, and you change. You change completely. I remember when I first came home and I told Virginia, I'm a Christian you're a Christian yeah you need to read your Bible you need to study the word she's like what what are you talking about she didn't understand it and in a month's time she saw me change and she's like who is this person like this is not my husband this is somebody else it's almost like the the bot the that movie the body snatchers you know you someone's taken the old guy and put a new guy in place you know type of thing because God just begins to work in your life and he changes you. And that's why I can't understand why people aren't changing. You know, they're calling themselves Christians and they still have the pride and the arrogance. They still have the, the sin. That should be going away. And as it's being revealed, you should be saying, Lord, help me with this. Help me with this. You know, I was asking my wife actually the last couple of days, said, I need you to, to help me. She's like, help you. I'm like, I need you to help me. I need you to pray for me. I'm just struggling with this thing and I don't know how to get rid of it. I want it to go, but man, it's just a part of me. It's like ingrained in me, like my color. How do you get rid of that, you know? And I says, could you pray for me? And she's like, yeah, I can pray for you. I'm not promising it's gonna go because I really want it to, but you know, it has to be God that takes it away. That should be all our desires of the Lord. That he begins to show us things and we're like, man, Lord, Help me, help me to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, that I could love like him. I can walk like him. I can speak like him. That's the desire of a Christian. <clears throat> Give him a chance. Ask him to come into your heart. 